Welcome to our Heritage Talk, Saved from Extinction, exploring how archaeology is saving our aviation heritage. Part 1 looks at discovering the wreckage with Graham Scott, a senior marine archaeologist and our speaker. For today's wreck, I'm going to take you into the air. Although, as I am a marine archaeologist, you can probably guess that uh, that aircraft is going to come from the sea. Now, IFA-2 is a new electricity interconnector cable between Hampshire and Normandy in France. It's a joint venture between our national grid and RTE in France. By connecting the British and French electricity grids, it enables up to a thousand megawatts of power to be transferred between Britain and France. It involves laying uh, a cable along a 200 kilometer route across the English Channel, uh, course La Manche to the French, or perhaps Chen Anglaise, if we want to give a nod to both nations. Now, the route of the cable was designed as far as possible to avoid the wrecks of ships and aircraft on the seabed. However, the channel has always been a busy place. A front line more than once with major ports and naval bases, the seabed is littered with historic wrecks. Nowhere is more littered with this archaeological detritus of war and mischance than the Solent, which you will see I'm pointing to with my mouse up here. And amongst the wreckage on the seabed are a good deal of unexploded ordnance or UXO, bombs, mines, shells, and small arms ammunition. These have the potential to cause catastrophe if the cable is laid on top of them. So the entire route in the Solent had to be surveyed and inspected by UXO contractors. And as a result of this, in July 2018, a UXO diver investigating a lump on the seabed found using multi-beam sonar and metal detecting off Leon Soland here, discovered that it was something more interesting than a boulder or UXO. As the archeologists for the scheme, we were therefore called in to carry out further investigations. And what had first been described as just metal debris turned out to be the remains of an old military aircraft. It was lying on clay, which had prevented it from sinking completely into the seabed. Now, military aircraft wrecks are protected from disturbance by legislation in the UK. That landed national grid with a problem. They weren't able to route their cable safely around it because Bending a cable can cause uh, issues with overheating, so they'd have to recover it under license. Therefore, over the period of five weeks, between May and June 2019, last year, the aircraft was recovered from the seabed by a team uh, comprising specialist marine contractors and ourselves. Now, there was evidence that it might be a naval aircraft, so a team from the Fleet Air Arm Museum, starring their experts David Morris and William Gibbs, was also involved. And in this image here, you can see a large part of the remains of the aircraft awaiting transport off the recovery vessel to the museum, each piece having already been recorded and labelled. Now, although the aircraft was not complete, most of it had survived. This is a 3D model we produced after videoing the wreck during the diving. In fact, I took the video that the model was produced from. And the smaller image is a side scan sonar image, which shows the site and the wider seabed around. Now this is a view looking down with an aircraft silhouette superimposed. 
only part of the aircraft was actually exposed on the seabed. The rest had to be dug out. It was lying upright on the clay, as you can see in the lower right image. It had a single engine, but a large cockpit. The propeller blades had all broken off. The tail had also broken off and was missing, but fragments of it were found under the aircraft. It had what we call a high wing design and therefore was lying over on its left wing with the wing tip lying on the seabed. The unsupported right starboard wing had become detached um, sometime after the aircraft had been lost and had fallen onto the seabed below. Fortunately for us, there was no large ordnance such as bombs or a torpedo, and no human remains were found. Unsurprisingly, given that it had been in seawater for decades, the wreckage that could be seen when the aircraft was first found was in a very poor condition, and there was some evidence that it might have been hit at some time by the scallop dredgers that operate in this part of the Solent. However, the parts of the aircraft that had been buried were in much better condition. And a large metal dive break or flap, which you can see in the photograph on the left hand side, was recovered from the wreck. You can see it here. Uh, follow my mouse on the silhouette below and here on the 3D model. Flaps are normally used to reduce um, an aircraft's stalling speed and therefore their takeoff and landing speeds. However, dive bombers also use what are effectively extra flaps to control their dives. By lowering them against the airflow, they created drag. This in turn reduced the dive bomber's dive speed, enabling the pilot to avoid exceeding what is called the red line speed. Now, not only did this allow the pilot to stay in control, it helped him to drop his bombs more accurately. Now, perhaps the famous, the, 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 perhaps the most famous dive bomber, the German Stuka, had air brakes. This image of a Stuka is from a British wartime publication called Know Your Enemy. Now, the Stuka's dive brakes were mounted under the wings. However, the flap that was recovered from our site, our wreck, had been attached to the trailing after edge of the wing, and it was identified as a Youngman flap, a British design. Now, the engine turned out to be a Merlin 27 litre liquid cooled piston engine designed by Rolls Royce. This is, well, I would, I, I was going to say perhaps, but I would say perhaps undoubtedly the most famous aero engine of them all. And it was an engine that powered iconic aircraft such as the Spitfire and Lancaster subject to much upgrading during the Second World War, as the Allied and Axis Air Forces competed to produce the best aircraft. And this particular engine turned out, when it was examined, to be a Merlin 32. Now, this variant was designed for maximum power at low altitude and was mainly used by the fleet air arm. A Boeing identification plane was stamped FM, indicating that it was made by Furry Aviation. There are other signs for this as well. Uh, the silver colour um, uh, found inside the plane, the silver paint colour, and also the black colour of components, all believed to be typically furries. If you look on the left, this is something to do with the engine. These are cordite filled blank cartridges used for starting the engines. 
and uh, they were removed just down here. They were removed by the UXO team uh, that we had on board and safely destroyed. Now, the tail wheel, which you can see middle top, was found nearby, not actually during the recovery operations, but by a survey that we uh, carried out beforehand. And in the considerable gloom uh, on the seabed, um, I found this um, object by the simple expedient of tripping over it whilst I was diving. Now, we don't know how it became detached, although the tail of the aircraft, as I've already said, is, is, was missing. And also uh, on the top left, you'll see this interesting object. Um, this is an arrestor hook, and it was found under the rear fuselage. Now, a arrestor hook is only fitted to those aircraft designed to operate from an aircraft carrier and is therefore an obvious characteristic of fleet air arm aircraft. Evidence of the aircraft having folding wings was also found. Uh, the middle lower image is of the hydraulic rams and fittings that would have helped to fold the port wing. And folding wings are characteristic of aircraft designed to operate from aircraft carriers because they have to be maneuvered and stored in much smaller spaces than are usually available to aircraft operated from airfields. And here's a close-up of the arrestor hook. And I want you to note from this that it doesn't look very worn. In fact, it looks quite new. Uh, all the muck you can see on it is everything that's accumulated on it while it's been on the seabed. And the fact that it looks new will be of significance later on when we look at which aircraft this was. Here you can see how an arrestor hook was used, was lowered on approach to uh, the aircraft carrier flight deck, and the idea was that the pilot would effectively catch the hook on steel wires rigged across the deck. And if you look uh, carefully, you can just see the lower arrestor hook underneath the aircraft to the left of the main undercarriage, just there. The wires on the flight deck obviously had a bit of give. Um, but would nevertheless quickly bring the aircraft to a halt, hopefully without giving the pilot uh, whiplash. Now, arrestor hooks made it easier to land on a carrier and reduce the very real risk that the pilot would overshoot. This was embarrassing if you had to go round again and make another attempt to land, but it was also potentially fatal if you hit the superstructure or something on deck or heaven forbid, fail to gather enough speed to take off again. And the aircraft ran out of deck and fell into the sea. The consequences of that in the days before ejector seats were usually fatal. Thank you for watching part one of our heritage talk, Saved from Extinction, exploring how archaeology is saving our aviation heritage.